Welcome, founders, to Startups.com. We are live. We got a great show for you today. We have my colleague and friend and brother in arms, Ryan Rattan, joining us. He's the chief marketing officer as well as a co-founder here at Startups.com. And we're going to have the pleasure of hearing from him in just a moment. Before we begin, I just want to welcome Q as our regular host here. She's our producer and editor and all of you are probably getting to know Jen a lot if you attend our meetings here at startups.com. And this show is brought to you by us. Startups.com, we have this podcast called Startup Therapy. And actually, one of the hosts of Startup Therapy is right here, Mr. Ryan Rattan. And this podcast, I came to startups.com because I really enjoyed this podcast and was talking about who we are, what we do as founders and all the stuff. It was like this no BS look and I really enjoyed it. By the way, if you're here and I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge, if you're here joining us from the Pitch Deck workshop, unfortunately Will couldn't do his workshop today. We're gonna get into Pitch Decks in just a moment. We have adjusted the program for you, but I wanted to introduce Ryan first. Ryan, give us a little bit about your background, who you are, what you do at startups.com. Oh man, what don't we do here at startups.com? Long, long time founder, right? This is, this is a disease I caught early and I I had not found a cure for it. Here at Startups.com, we you know, we, we were a small management team, as you well know, Ed. So we get into a little bit of everything. My day-to-day -day is, is spent around figuring out how we get customers, how we communicate our value to people, and then helping tons and tons of founders do that. I just, just got off three back-to-back -back office hours doing exactly that. So I, I love the fact that we get to roll up our sleeves, get into the weeds, and, and do this at the at the startup level. Even though we're getting to be, you know, kind of a, a big company, I get to live <laughs> on that startup adrenaline and that bleeding edge all it's day long, best. every day, thanks it's, to all of our users. Yeah, it's the best. Appreciate it. Before I show you this pitch deck, I'm going to get your opinion, and we're going to tear down a pitch deck and review. This isn't from one of our members. It's from OutsideStartups.com, but I like to do this. Give us a bit of background, because I know you've written some angel checks like I have, but yep. how many startups have you done? How much money have you raised? And what's been your history in terms of writing checks for other founders? Oh, geez. Okay. So how many startups have I done? This, this is, I guess, depending on how we count the startups.com portfolio and the ones that we've acquired versus the ones that we've built, it's somewhere between eight and 14. So eight to 14 startups. And, and I think you and I talked about this on a podcast once around like what I count as a startup. Yeah. Um, I've killed so many of them at the at the idea validation stage and the MVP stage. Oh yeah. Um, because that's when they should die, you know, uh, uh, if they're if they're going to. Uh, and I don't count any of those. I mean, there, there's probably a couple of dozen uh, in in that little in that little graveyard. In terms of the the amount of money raised, I have been primarily a bootstrapper. I have raised somewhere around seven hundred fifty thousand in total for myself. Mm -hmm. That said, we've done a heck of a lot of fundraising consulting here at startups.com. And prior to startups.com, I was doing a lot of startup consulting and a huge part of that was, was funding preparation and funding consulting. It's got to have to go back to, I haven't thought about this number in a long time. Ed. Prior to startups.com, probably around 25, 30 million raised. Okay. Um, keep in mind, based on my vintage, because uh, I'm old, um, <laughs> when I started doing this, seed rounds were a heck of a lot smaller. Yes. Right. It, it, what, what we call a series A or series uh, seed now was like a series B back then. Yes. Um, so the dollar amounts were, were significantly smaller. So I was more of a, a volume of transactions than a volume of dollars guy. Um, and a lot of times helping people raise for much smaller, much smaller amounts to get things kicked off. I was typically helping people with pre-seed seed stage funds until we got to startups.com and it moved into series A, B, C and startups. We've, I mean, we're catching up on a billion dollars raised now. Okay. Yeah. I brag and I say 750 million. Um, you've been around since the beginning with all that, the history of fundable, yep. all those things. What about, like, I've written some pretty weird angel checks in my day. Nothing, <laughs> nothing huge. Is there right? anything other than a weird angel <laughs> check? Know, They're yeah. all weird. Like They're I've, all weird. I've written four figure, five figure angel checks. I don't think I've ever really made money off of anything that I've done. I you know, just want to give back. But what's been your experience as far as an investment perspective? Yeah, so it's interesting. And I think uh, and Will and I have kind of a similar perspective on this. Since, since starting startups.com, I've actually written very few angel checks. Um, we have preferred instead to inject expertise, inject help, and not take equity. I mean, being a, being a very bootstrap kind of focused guy, I, I often want startups to think the same way. So when they come to me asking for, for money, what's the classic, you know, ask for money, get advice. And, and part of that is like an ask for, ask for advice and get money. They come to me asking for money. And very frequently, what I'll end up doing is helping me figure out like why they don't actually need my money. So instead of me giving you $50,000 or $100,000, let me tell you why you don't need my money and how you can get to the same place anyways, while maybe taking on some money from somebody else. So in the last, in the last 10 years, I have written 
four angel checks, of which one of them still has a chance of paying me back. <laughs> you know, I should actually take your advice. I probably should have given more advice than actually writing some checks, but it's been a good experience. That's what we do here. We're all founders helping other founders. And this yeah. is one of the best parts about startups.com is people want to help each other. Like once you've had some experience, you just can't help it. You, it's like being part of a fraternity or sorority or whatever club and you just have yep. this desire to help other founders. You no. get so excited if it worked for us. The first <laughs> thing you want to do is go and share it with somebody else. Like, I just found this thing that actually did what I expected it to. I can't wait to go tell the rest of the founder world about it. I mean, this is this is the way it always works in the founder space. While at the same time, you and I have spoken about this a lot of times, we commiserate because when it doesn't work for us, we have a way to just go out and give everybody big virtual hugs hugs and cookies and say, hey, we understand it didn't work for us. We've had these catastrophic failures. So let's all commiserate together. Share those two. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's take a look at this deck. This was sent. And this is one of the decks that was sent to me by a YouTube subscriber. And I gave some advice back then. I said, send it back to me. I do remember this. I get so many decks on a regular basis. And by the way, for those of you out there, if you want your deck reviewed, just send it to us. Leave a like, comment, subscribe. That would helpful. But also a comment. I'd like my deck reviewed. If you're watching this on the recording or if you're part of the startups.com community, just email it to me, advisor at startups.com, and we'll make sure that we get your feedback on this. But let's take a look at this. So we've got Neurofia and Diabetes Care for Millions Across Middle East and Africa. First of all, this is what I love to ask, Ryan. What's your first impression of this cover page? I'm very curious what the specific solutions will be uh, once we get beyond this, right? It raises a question for me around like, how specific does the solution need to be for Middle East and Africa? Are they the same solution in the Middle East and Africa? Very different markets. So it, it raises a lot of questions, which I think is ultimately a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. Instead of having a kitschy, buzzy marketing hype, like revolutionizing our interface with the next generation, you know, da, da, da. I think that's yep. pretty straightforward. So you heard it straight. And, and let me just back up for a sec. The reason I wanted to do this for everybody here is so that you know, I am not just giving feedback on pitch decks in a tunnel myopically just me we have a team and you're going to see that ryan may be seeing things a little differently than i may see them i have different experiences as well like i was a general partner for funds and you know i had to learn how to deploy capital and source deals and everything like that ryan would be more like an angel investor who would write directly yep. or he's got the experience of watching all these other founders raise money and get checks so that's the perspective that we're coming from keep that in mind as you're watching us go through this deck. And I want to appreciate this founder for having the cojones just to get in and to run the gauntlet. Like, you know, yeah. dump right in front. It takes a lot of courage. I think it's important. Founders will learn. Here's the problem. I'll read this. In the Middle East and Africa, MEA region, 97 million people have diabetes with 54% 54% remaining undiagnosed. This leads to an economic burden of 88.3 million billion due to outdated ineffective care causing 1.2 million preventable deaths annually. What are your thoughts, Ryan? Look, it's it's some compelling data, right? It gives us a sense for the scale of the problem. The the economic burden, I, I it's it's in specific, right? Like how does how does it lead to this? Does our solution actually address this? We talk about this a lot. Like we want to be really careful when we tee up the problem statement. One of the examples that we'll use often is like if, if you've got a, a solar solution and what you talk about is global warming is a problem, your solar solution has some level of impact there, but it doesn't directly address global warming. Right, not not directly, not specifically. And it certainly doesn't eliminate it. So we always want to be really careful here. So are we proposing that our solution, you know, it's an economic burden of eighty-eight point three billion? There's a difference between an economic burden of eighty-eight point three billion and an incentive. So is that actually the size of our market? Eighty-eight point three billion. That's the size of the impact. So in theory, people might be willing to spend eighty-eight point three billion, i.e., that's our market size, in order to alleviate this problem. But that's not necessarily true. Right, because it depends on who's actually the recipient of this burden. Right? Are we talking about is this the, an impact to GDP? Is this an impact to 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 private company productivity, public sector productivity? Where is this? Where is this being manifested? So there's a few things with this, and I, I want to see how the solution addresses this. But there's a few things here that I'd like to see tied more specifically to to the problem, and I'd like to make this more relatable. Because remember, who are we talking to here? We're not talking to the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. We're not talking to the WHO. We're talking mm -hmm. to an investor. So how do we make this real to an investor, right? Even things like 1.2 million preventable deaths annually, that's a big number. And that feels like something that maybe we want to impact, but it's also can be really tough to like, I actually can't picture 1.2 million people. Can you, can you add? 
Well, I like the fact that it's a big number and it's tough for me because I don't have diabetes. I've never experienced anybody with diabetes. That's the reason I'm stepping back a little bit, right? Yeah. So again, how do we make this more relatable, right? So how do we tie this to, to that particular condition? Um, and how do we make this a little bit more, more real, concrete, and kind of visible to, right? Anytime I can, I like to try to bring a problem down to the level of an individual who suffers that problem, because I feel like we can all do the mental gymnastics and multiplication to go from one to 97 million, but it's really hard to work backwards from big numbers. Sure. Right. Same thing. If somebody, if somebody, when we get to like later in the deck, when we're looking at things like the, 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 the financials, one of the things that I, I love to see, I need to see, if you want me to write a check, the thing I need to see is your individual unit economics. This is kind of a reverse of that same concept. So I want to see the, the individual economics of the problem versus just the, the, the scale problem, because at the scale problem level, I don't understand yet. And that's always a problem. Like you might make me understand later in the, in the presentation, if you keep my attention to later in the presentation. But if you lose me here, we've already lost. So the challenge here is I don't yet know how much of this problem we actually intend to impact and 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 how much of this is truly part of what, what we can address. I know we're not to market size yet. We'll get to addressable market, but really there's there's a lot of disconnect between these numbers for me. And that's an important thing I want to highlight. So let me draw the principles here because Ryan demonstrated this beautifully. As soon as you create cognitive friction, it's good that you've got numbers in there and I'm always advocating Get numbers in it. Don't, just don't make an opinion. Like, so many people are dying from diabetes. Diabetes sucks, right? The African healthcare system sucks, and we're not helping people with diabetes. The fact that we got numbers, good start. But if you overload it and you start creating that friction, so with this $88.3 billion number, are you saying that 97 million people, it costs $88.3 billion to help them? Or is there another economic burden because they can't go to work, they can't do this, they can't do that? That's the reason being clear and precise and just throwing in big numbers for throwing in big numbers sake is not going to help you. You almost swung the pendulum in the other direction a little yep. too far. And that's a good principle here, but at least you got the numbers. We're tracking in the right direction, but here's where the deck is going to go off the rails a little bit. And you're going to see this problem right away because I get into another problem slide, right? Uh -oh. And th this is an issue. And, <laughs> and this slide is jam packed. And now we're even more confused. I'm not even going to spend time on this, but you know, Ryan, what is it about founders? Do you think that put like walls of text and have like five problem slides and five solution slides and their decks are like 30 pages long in your experience, what happens in their minds for them to keep piling uncertainty, on the way? Okay? Uncertainty, uncertainty. I don't know which of these things is likely to have the most impact on my audience. Therefore I'll just throw it all at them. It's, I get it logically, I get it emotionally. It is absolutely the wrong approach. Uh, there's, there's a phrase I'm very, very fond of, which is communication is the burden of the sender. That slide is the reader's burden. Absolutely the reader's burden. I have to read through all of that. I have to try to make sense of it. I have to decipher it. It is, it is absolutely the, the last thing you want to do with, with, with a slide. No, number one, I now have to try to connect this back to problem slide number one, right? There should never be more than one problem slide, right? This is, this is going back to just like not being clear enough around what we, what we think is going to be the most compelling um, it's okay to have all this in a working document, right? And to try to understand and to start to pitch some of these concepts to people, ask people, hey, you know, if I tell you this, what kind of reaction? Do I, get? If I tell you that, what kind of reaction do I get? But in a final presentable deck, two problem slides and, and, and this much information, can you jump back to the slide really quick? For example, we don't really need to, and this is, this is getting a little more into market size, for example, but when we have two markets, whether they're completely parallel, whether they might be slightly tangential, whether one is an expansion market or not, these are really two markets with roughly the same problem that we're going to solve, we don't need to portray both of these here. We can make this, this slide at least that much more simple by just eliminating one of these. And if you have to eliminate one of these, then you just take a look and say, which one of these is more compelling, mm -hmm. right? I don't need to know about MEA and Africa right now. We can talk about the fact that they're both markets that we're going to address. We actually said that in the very first slide. Um, but then here's some example data, right? I don't need every single bit of data. I need enough data to stay interested in the story. Mm -hmm. The minute yep. we throw too much data, I lose the story. And instead of uh, instead of being somebody who's consuming a story, I have to turn into a data analyst. Right. And on. you've now you've now completely derailed my train of thought. And now I have to make sense of something. Well, let me treat you there, Ryan. Now that we're here, pow! We don't have another third. No, just kidding. Oh. We, we got a middle of the road. Now we get in a narrative, right? Like if you read this, the problem we solve. So we just did two problem slides and now we're saying, this is the problem we solve. I'm thinking to myself, well, shouldn't we have covered that in the first slide? But we got this story. Now I'm just gonna pause for a second. By this time, if, you, if you're a regular investor and you've seen a hundred 
over 100x for the week. And we have had an investor on this show, Greg Welch. And I asked him, I said, I look at 10 pitch decks today. And I asked him, like, how many pitches do you get a week? And he's like, literally hundreds. So we scan them. So yeah. I'm letting you all know the regular investor, angel or not, has already checked out of this deck. Like, I'm already done. I'm not looking... Yep. Anymore, it took me 90 seconds to disqualify the deck, which is the reason we harp on it. We're going to move a little deeper into idea validation, talk a bit about it, but that's because this is our job. We are here to help you, but don't think for one moment that investors are going to, this is what Will says, an investor is not going to sit by the fireplace, open up your pitch deck, light up a pipe, go grab a, a cup of hot cocoa and read your deck and pontificate on it and think it through and spend hours on it. Literally, we're done, but we're going to move a little deeper into this. Ryan, you got thoughts on that? Well, I, I am sitting next to my fireplace. So I don't <laughs> want to call you a liar outright, but um, sometimes we do. So you know what's funny? Like I actually have a, I have a method and I, I'm sure you probably have, have similar. When I grab a deck like this, one of the first things I'll do, I clicked and I'm not kidding. I just basically page through, like I'll, I'll click in like three slides. It's like one, two, three, four. I just want to see when it turns into like data spaghetti or something else. It's just literally a, a half second per slide sense check. And oftentimes that's enough for me. And I'm just like, nope. We're not looking at this one. We're not looking at this in detail. This is this is going right back to the founder with uh with with, with that feedback essentially, which is this you're gonna lose everybody in the first two slides. Right. Sometimes it's that easy. You heard it here. We're giving you the goods. Let's look at this slide though. We interviewed over 50 people we with diabetes. <laughs> we do for education. And a common theme was they felt overwhelmed, alone, and confused. Patients describe their doctors as having next patient mentality, providing outdated, ineffective guidelines, and relying solely on blood work from that day, leaving them without comprehensive ongoing support. What's your immediate reaction to this, Ryan? Well, it's completely disconnected from the original problem statement, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the thread that connects it is there are people with diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. But we didn't talk about any of this. We talked about economic impact. We talked about uh, burden on the economy. We talked about the, 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 the cost uh, to the economy. Now we're talking about what, how, how, a, how a patient suffers from, from diabetes. So mm -hmm. are we going to solve an economic impact problem? Or are we going to solve a very, a very patient level problem? Because they're very different things, right? Now, one one outcome may may tangentially lead to the other. Um, but again, now we're asking me to try to figure that out. Now I have to go, okay, how does this map back to the numbers that, that we that we saw in the beginning? Um, so you're you're giving me now some extremely subjective statements. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm overwhelmed, uh, alone, confused. Um next patient mentality right so again like it also says problem we solve we're still talking about the problem we haven't gotten to any solution i'm also now and this is where like we go back to like cognitive dissonance on that first slide the, the intro slide i started to get some idea of like what was going to be presented then then we got into problem slide one which i would have assumed would have been our only problem slide so you start to kind of think ahead and you want that to happen you want people to kind of guess ahead like okay so what's the solution going to be to this at this point, I am utterly baffled in terms of what they're actually going to present as a solution. I can no longer guess. And not in a good, ooh, I'm curious to find out kind of way. I'm like, on one hand, we're talking about this. On the other hand, we talked about a completely different level of problem. And now and now we're talking about doctor-patient interactions. So where are we actually going to get involved? At this point, I'm going to assume, I'm going to guess that it's going to be more down to like the patient level and, and how, we, how we handle that, right? We did talk about the number of patients, the number of people have it. We also talked about the number of people who aren't diagnosed. So is this going to be a diagnostic tool or is this going to be a patient workflow? Is this going to be, right? So you see where I'm at with this. Absolutely. Literally four slides in. I still have no idea where we're going, and that's dangerous. Pitch decks can baffle investors, a great word. And a reminder, you just don't want to make the investor do work. Like it's, no. you don't make it easy for them. Empathize. If you're in the audience right now, we've had people kind of come in and you've got questions, load them up in the Q&A box because we're going to start answering them. If this conversation is sparking questions for you, put them in. We're going to spend time on that. We'll spend all day on questions that we need to because we want to get you the information that you need. My other big issue with this is that we have over, interviewed over 50 people. One, you say over 50 people. That's not helpful. And if you're I, I didn't want to touch, I, 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 yeah, like to me, it's like, yeah, when we're talking about millions and millions of people and, and we went and talked to 50. Exactly. I don't believe lot, it. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't give me a lot of confidence. Right. Yeah. And at the same time, I don't believe these testimonies. Now I'm sure this founder is not lying, but an investor is going to be really thinking about this. And so if you said, you know, we went out and surveyed over, you know, a hundred thousand people and this is the data then you got my attention but if you've done customer discovery keep it in customer discovery use it to guide you but keep it tight here's a solution 
Neurofias supports diagnosed diabetes patients with real-time feedback on their health, expert nutritional advice, and 24-7 support from qualified diabetes experts and educators to control blood sugar, improve their lifestyle. For undiagnosed patients, we emphasize early detection and education to prevent serious complications and lower health care costs by 10x. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Ryan, your reaction. Again, we're... <laughs> We're saying a lot here and we're conveying very little, right? We're lots of words, very little takeaway, very little meaning, real-time feedback. Is that digital feedback? Is this, are we talking about, because if we're talking about continuous glucose monitoring, why aren't we just calling it that, right? Mm -hmm. they, they referenced it on a previous slide in one of the testimonials. So again, I'm guessing that maybe we're talking about CGM, but I don't know that yet. And then there's 24 from, from qualified diabetes experts are these doctors. What is a qualified diabetes expert? I don't know what that means. So you're introducing all of this uncertainty in my mind. Every single slide in the pitch deck should make me more certain about what I'm looking at and where we're going. And so far in this deck, I have become less and less certain with each step that we're taking. And it's funny because at this point, I can't even begin to offer some advice around how we would clean this up because I still don't know where we're going. I have to know what we're actually trying to accomplish. And same for you, Ed, before we can start to say like, okay, here's some things I might change about this deck to make this more clear. I still don't know quite where we're going yet. So I can't even begin to get to that point. So as somebody who wants to help this deck be better, I'm engaged. I'm, I'm going to dig in. We're going to keep looking at this. As an investor, I would, I, would have, I would have written my little parachute out of here a long time ago. This is the issue where founders say, we can solve all these problems, but you have to commit to one. I get into these yep. conversations and founders say, do I always have to solve just one problem? We, we do so many things. It's so much better than you know, what you're describing. I'm like, investors don't care. They want to know what your beachhead is and yep. they want to know you're going to dominate. Just like Facebook said, we're going to dominate students at Harvard. We're going to get this going over there. Let's back it up and just, just pontificate for a moment with us. This was a problem and this is the problem of the problem is we don't know where it's going because it's split off in all these other directions. But let's just say, for example, the problem is X amount of people go undiagnosed with diabetes. And before their diagnosis, they should be able to get help, but they don't. And this causes an economic problem. It costs X yep. millions of dollars to help these people. One problem, bang. And then if the solution said, we detect diabetes early with this real cool Fangle Dazzle app that people can track, and here's how we're going to get them on board with that. And it's all about prevention before it happens. One problem, one solution, that's what you want to do. In other words, if you say the problem is something is slow, expensive, and manual, then you solve the problem by making it fast, cheap, and automated. It's as simple as yeah. that. But these two, this problem and this solution statement don't line up. What do you think, Ryan? I, I agree completely. And, and because we're trying to address more than one problem, and now we're, we're providing more than one solution, it creates this additional dissonance around which data was supporting which. Like, did we clearly, because I'm trying to remember back now, and this is what, you know, maybe an investor will flip back if they're super interested. Most of the time they're going to go, do I remember why this is important? So did we ever completely disaggregate the impact of people who are diagnosed but have subpar treatment, what was the economic impact of that? What's the cost of that? It, ergo, what is our potential upside in solving it versus the undiagnosed? I do not remember a clear delineation between those two. We sort of lumped all the diabetes data together. That's right. So here's the impact. And then there's a bunch of undiagnosed people. So does that mean that we're not even, does that mean that if they're undiagnosed, we have an estimate of that? Did we include that in that economic data? Or is that is that a, you know, a roughly 50% additional people who are undiagnosed? And, and so roughly 50% undisclosed or unaccounted for economic impact at this point or not. So again, it's just, there's a ton of uncertainty here and that creates a lot of discomfort for, for investors. It's definitely not making me push my pen towards the checkbook. <laughs> let's, let's summarize. So for all of you working on your pitch decks, really what it do boils down is problem solution. And we'll talk about market size in just a moment, but those are the three most important slides that really establish the direction for your deck. Market size, because you, the investor needs to know if this is a big enough market to warrant the size of check, if they're a scout or an analyst or a partner, they need to be looking at big markets, right? So we're going to get there in just a moment. But lesson here is if your problem and solution aren't tight, everything goes off the rails. Like we're just going to completely check out. And that's what I'm going to do at this moment in time is I'm going to send this deck back to the founder. I'm going to say, you need to rework your problem solution to one slide each. If they don't fit on one slide each, then we've got a major issue. I don't want to look at the market size because we've already kind of talked about it in terms of this is how many people. So I'm going to guess that we're going to go in that direction. But if you can come up with the right problem and the right solution, here's my question, Ryan, how do founders do that? 
Let's say we got founders on this call right now and they're like, I'm showing my deck around. Nobody understands the problem solution. It doesn't make sense. How do you narrow it down or streamline it, make it concise so other people can understand? Of course, there's some necessary context there, right? It depends on the type of solution we're pitching. It depends on your audience. With something uh, that I, it, where it's very relatable to a large number of people, right? This is, this is diabetes. This isn't a, an extremely rare, you know, 0.005% of the population blood cancer, right? So this is something that people have context for and have some understanding for. So when we have that, we know that there's there's some general context for it. We play on that. And this is where, again, like I said at the beginning, I like to bring it down closer to an individual level so we can make this relatable, right? The more relatable we can make this now, we can't necessarily know, like, if your investor that you're talking to has diabetes, they will understand it at a very different level. If they have a family member who has it, they will have a very different level of understanding. They clearly know that it's a problem, that there is economic impact, all this other stuff. And so we, we want to start there. We want to be as relatable as possible with the problem and how we how we present it to people. Again, communication being the burden of the sender. Think about how they're going to think about, feel about, and wonder about the information that we present, right? And we want to create some level of all three of those elements. But at this point, this one's just creating a lot of wonder. Not of the wonder, not of the good kind, not like, oh, this is wonderful. It's just making me go, I'm still not sure yet. <laughs> so when you're thinking about your problem, think about the way that it will will most be easily received by the population you're pitching it to, right? And this changes, of course, if we're pitching this to a customer, if you're talking to the person who has diabetes, you don't talk about the fact that 97 million people, they don't care. Uh -huh. They care about the one person who has it, which is them, right? And so when we consider our audience, this often becomes significantly you know, easier. So we want to think about what are we trying to do? We're trying to compel somebody that there is enough of a problem and one that's easy to understand and that we have a solution that is elegantly aligned with the specific problem that we laid out. Right. And I think this is where founders really get it wrong. They think that like the more problems we throw out there, the better. It's like, oh, we do all this stuff. It just makes it so much harder to understand that we elegantly match our solution to the problem. Right. Well, we can just do that at one level. What's the most compelling aspect of this? Right. If you're going to start to tell me now that so we've created a an efficient patient onboarding system, I'm going to go, okay, that'll impact this problem. But is that the most compelling thing you could do for 97 million people that have diabetes, right? So it, it and look, sometimes that is, it's like, well, but this is the problem that we can address. This is the thing that we need to solve for. Um, so in this case, again, because I'm still not sure, I think I can answer this question better and use <laughs> this deck as an example. When we, if we go a little further again, I really do understand because I'm still, I, I, maybe I'm missing it. Is anybody else clear? on exactly what this does? It doesn't, it's not clear. And if we dug deeper in, I'm sure it would become clear, but we're not even gonna do that because we'll spend the next three hours trying to dig through. And that's the whole point of this exercise. Is that what is solution slide number two look like? Is there a solution slide number two? It goes into- I hope not. No, there is. It, it, oh. it goes into how it works, like it's a platform, okay. but it's pretty general. And again, the whole point of this is, is that if you lose the investor through problem solution, yep. your, the rest of your deck is moot. And so I'm going to be a little hard on founders because what happens is founders keep sending to me and they torture to death and they just say, here's my yeah. next, next version. And I'm going to get to the point where it's like, if I can't get through a problem solution and be super clear, I'm just not going to look at the rest of the deck is what's that's going it. to happen, right? That's, what, that's exactly what happens. And that's the best lesson that all the founders are going to learn here in how investors react to their deck. We do have some questions though. I think, Jen, what do we got? All right. So the first question that came in is, do you have a standard template with a pitch deck you feel is good to use? I'll feel this super quick. Yes, we do have a standard template, but big caveat. If you go to Sequoia, they want their decks a certain way. If you go to A16Z, they want their decks a certain way. How do I know? We talk to them. Like we've literally heard from the associates, this is the way that we want our decks and they're different because that's just how it works. So it's going to be your job to find a general idea of what investors like. And there's so many different formats that we use. For example, Sequoia really likes the problem solution market size format. Other investors like, I want a purpose statement. I want an overarching sort of like a one sentence executive summary. And so founders get all upset with us and say, you told us to do this. And I go, we have just given you tools. You have to decide. It just so happens Sequoia being the biggest game in town, we happen to use, everybody kind of likes to use their thing because we follow the patterns. So we do have, templates and we can't give them to you if you're part of startups.com just ask us i'll send you a template with a general guidance in terms of what you should put in your deck but it's a general rule of thumb it's not set in stone and it's going to be up to you to decide what works best for you tell the story and we can go from there ryan how do you pick what slides go into your deck let me let me, let me bounce off that so that that's gonna that's gonna depend highly on the evidence uh, and the audience that i'm gonna go pitch right so that depends on who i'm gonna go talk to 
to your point, different people are going to want to see it different ways. Rather than a template, what I like is a framework for communicating, right? And I'm not trying to split hairs or, or, or mince words here, but if you think about like how we deliver the, the our pitch deck perfection or, or the pitch deck bootcamp, right? What we have is an exercise to help you clarify the key points that need to be communicated. Templature around the slide, in my opinion, can be very dangerous because then people start to try to plug in rather than think through. They're like, how do I make myself fit this? That's not actually the exercise, nor is having one template versus another. The exercise is there are a number of things, including the problem, the solution, how it works, the market size, the team, the traction, all of these things, regardless of the order in which they appear, whether it's 12, 14, 16 slides, there are a number of things that as a founder, you have to know how to clearly communicate. Regardless of the template that you're going to use, if you nail that part of the exercise, applying it to whatever template, whoever wants to see becomes very, very simple. And so I think this is what we've done a really good job at startups.com, coaching people through the exercise of understanding what needs to be conveyed. Then you can decide whether it goes on a post-it, a postcard, a long form letter, a billboard. The medium matters a lot less. I need the template in this case matters a lot less than your ability to understand what needs to be said and why it needs to be communicated in that way. That's where I want founders to focus. If you're thinking, I need a template to do this, you're looking for a shortcut to a problem that doesn't exist. You're looking for a shortcut to quickly finishing a deck that probably nobody's going to want to read because you didn't go through the painful exercise of learning what and how to communicate these critical points. Couldn't have said it better myself. In other words, don't download Uber's pitch deck and swap out your logos and numbers. Find in a place. <laughs> go. Right? Okay. Yep. Don't do that. Don't use that as no. a template, but we definitely have the guidance for you. Next question. What is it, Jen? Okay, I'm going to jump to question number three, just because this kind of tails off on that. This person's asking, do we have to change the pitch deck based on who we are pitching to? Let's say for an angel who is super technical versus a non-technical one. Great question. And yes, a thousand times, Danielle. Like it is absolutely. Again, I'm going to say, I've said it twice, right? Communication is the burden of the sender. That means that we have to think about who we are communicating to. We have to do our best job of making that as easy for them to absorb as possible and, and to get the right reaction out of them. So yes, if you're dealing with a non-technical person going on and on about your database structures and, and, and how you guys hack to rig, they don't care. They're not going to understand. It's going to go over their head. It's going to make them uncomfortable. Last thing we want. Same thing. If you have a, a very highly technical founder and you gloss over your stack, they're going to go, or a technical investor, they're going to go like, well, I want to know about this, right? I want to understand because this is important to me. Ultimately, it may not be important to the overall outcome of the project, but we're catering to our audience. We always have to. We have to play to the audience. So if they like fiddle music, you got to bust out your fiddle. So <laughs> thinking about who you're presenting to is is super, super important. Um, and and make sure that you, you get as close to that as you can. This is where like doing background, doing research, looking at who else they've invested in, finding out how they present it if you can is is super, super valuable. You know, I, I know a lot of founders will take the approach like they just, they work endlessly on a pitch deck to come up with some like final perfect version. And then that's just the one that they use. There's no final perfect version unless you're only presenting to one investor, right? So don't get too caught up slides layout. Don't get married to the language. And of course, modify. Like if you consistently pitch a particular slide and people lean back and cross their arms or like tip their heads or look at each other, like, Take that feedback. Like they're not understanding. They're not resonating. They're not catching something there. Make those changes. But in addition to that, do everything you can to understand your audience and make sure that you modify them. And it's going to change from angels. Friends and family are going to need to hear it in a very different way than angels are going to need to hear it. When you get into series A, B, C, VCs, micro VCs, different than, than a PE firm, all of this stuff matters. This question is very common. And my answer is common. Like, don't be surprised based on what Ryan said. That's the principle. Don't be surprised if you have 10 different pitch dice by the end of the day. Yep. And you you pull it out. You're going to always have your master pitch deck, but there's that introductory screener deck that goes out in the introduction. Then there's a technical one where you share your stack. All of those things combined. I even had different pitch decks for different co-founders because sometimes different co-founders present and the decks have been completely different. Same problem, same solution, but the story inside has been different. All those things. So don't be afraid to try all the different versions, test them out. And like I said, don't be surprised if you have multiple versions. Next question. We got one more, Jen. Yes. The last one we have is from Chris saying, I've heard 20 to 30 words max per slide. Is this a general rule? How about balance of visuals and text in slides? The number of words per slide, it, it, certainly there, there is a max. Like if, if it looks like a wall of text, it's a wall of text, right? Nobody wants to look at a wall of text. Um, I just try to go back through and look at it and say, like, it's not really about the, the number of, of words. It, clearly, there's there's a number that's too many. I just go back through and, like, ask yourself, does this word add anything to this? Is this helping my understanding? Is it adding anything to this? Or, or, or is it, and sometimes even hurting the understanding? 
And so just try to try to think about how how you can strike that balance. There, there's, and I'm not gonna remember who said it now, it may have been Thomas Edison, make a thing as simple as it can be, but not more. We want to make sure that we're we're trimming fat off the steak and not muscle, right? We don't want to give up any of the well, I actually like fat and forget it. The steak analogy doesn't hold here. The metaphor was bad. Sorry, guys. <laughs> We want to cut fat and not muscle, right? We'll, just, we'll use me as the example. I need to cut some fat. I don't need to cut any muscle. In that case, we want to be clear that like when we're when we're going through and we're deleting things, how does it change the understanding? Just take a couple of those words out, reread it. Like, did that, did the augmentation help anything? Ask other people for feedback because you cannot have the expectation with investors that I have with my children. My expectation with my children is that they hear what I meant and not what I said, right? Investors will, will hear what you said. They're not going to hear what you meant. So make sure that every word on that deck and just refine and refine and refine. I've realized over time, I cannot write simply. I can simply edit, mm, yeah. right? And so spend your time editing. I cannot write simply, not the first time. I never get it right the first time. I have to get it out there and then I edit down and edit down and edit down and edit down and just make sure that you're not changing the meaning too far. And that's what I meant by here, what I, you know, make sure that you understand what I meant, not what I said. In this case, we don't have that luxury. So we have to make sure that we haven't trimmed away anything that does meaningfully change what people will take away from it. And it is an art and a science. This is where like, I love to look to some of our most famous ads, the ad examples that we have. Ads, the best ads you've seen, the ones that you know of, the ones that you remember, those have all done a very, very good job of this. How do we make it visual? How do we make it falsifiable? How do we make it clear and concrete, right? How do we make it something that we can say that nobody else can? When we bake these elements into what we're writing in our decks, we're writing better decks, right? But edit, edit, edit. There's so many times it's people like they, they, they finally figure out what they think they want to say and then they leave it. And it just doesn't get enough editorial pass and, and, and bounce it off people. Like I, I asked this question in our pitch deck, uh, the, the, the session that Will and I do, the, the public session, uh, Pitch Deck Perfection. One of the questions that I ask is, you know, where are you with your pitch deck? Uh, and there's a couple of choices there. Who has seen your pitch deck, right? I put it out to investors and, and, and some of the general public. Only my team, only my mom, right? And very frequently, like, are, are you kidding? Only my mom, right? And that's because like so very often people are working on a deck and they're so worried about perception. They're not letting anybody see it. I'm not suggesting you have to put it out to investors first. Let somebody see it, right? Mm -hmm. Let your friends look at it and see, do they understand any of this? Now, they're not investors, but they're still rational humans. Well, not all of my friends, but a lot of my friends are. <laughs> get feedback. Get we feedback. try to be That's right. That's how you'll know when you got this right. And then ask people what they take away from it. Also, one of my new favorite, fun, well, not, not new, but one of the, my favorite ways of using some of the large language models, we'll just use chat GPT as the example here, ask it to react to stuff. Play the role of a super snarky, very pessimistic investor. Read my deck, read this slide. Tell me what you take away from it. Where would you be confused? Where would you be excited? Would this upset you in any way? What? And just ask it to react. And now it's not perfect, but if you haven't shown it to any other humans, at least find some ways. If you're still afraid to show it to another person, show it to a machine and get some, get some generalized feedback. And it's often very enlightening, like what it'll come back with and tell you um, ah. will clear up some of the misconceptions around the translation between what's in your head and what's on the page. You know what? I haven't actually done that. That's a good hack. Let me give you another ChatGPT hack for those of you checking this out. I will literally ask ChatGPT, I'll say, put it down in a 30 words or less because ChatGPT tends to kind of bloat things to have it make yep. sense. And then I'll say, is there anything I'm missing from it if you had to add a few more words or try cutting that, that down a little more? And ChatGPT is fantastic because it will do comparisons. Like you can say, give me three versions of it and compare and you'll be able to see it. So doing comparisons and research using ChatGPT to get that reaction, that's a hack that I use. So try it. The other thing I'd like to add is, yes, Generally speaking, you can get headline statements down into 30 words or less. And then you add three bullet points, you're on the 35 words for the pitch slide, the slide under itself. I have tested it, I've seen it, it works. But when you've got a bio slide and you've got amazing logos that you put, use logos, those visuals, that's social proof, or you got bullet points, you may need more than 30 words for the bullet points, but don't write a whole biography that someone has to squint and sit there and you know curl up by the fire and they go, okay, I'm reading a memoir. So again, going back to what Ryan says, the burden's on you, make it easy for the investor. Great question. I hope this has been helpful. Let's move on to the next session because we want to kind of kind of pull out from Ryan everything we got. We want to get some good clips so everybody can learn. Okay, we're going to do this as a bullet round. So Q has gathered some questions. And so Ryan, she's going to ask these questions in rapid fire succession. I'd like you to give the shortest answers as possible. Let's get through these questions and then I want to get your hot take on our article. Q, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's do it. When it comes to pitching investors, what are the top three things a pitch deck must convey to stand out in early stage funding rounds? Compelling problem. It's understandable. Compelling solution. Compelling market size. It's, it's that simple for me, right? It, these are the three elements because the rest of it 
if I don't care about the problem or I don't believe the problem exists or I don't believe it's big enough, I'm not going to care about your solution. Even if I do care about your problem and I then I don't believe that your solution is viable, I'm not going to care about the rest of the deck. If I care about your problem, I care about your solution, but it turns out it's a really tiny market size. I may love this idea. I may want you to succeed, but I'm not going to invest in it because that's how I get paid back. So if I'm not hitting on these three things in an investor pitch, do you think I care who your team is? Do you think I care what your traction is? Do you think I care how it's done? No, I don't care how the sausage is made if I don't care, if I don't think that it's compelling sausage. So none of it matters. So problem solution market size for me will always be the most important things that we need to convey in the pitch and they need to tie together. And that we had a great example of that not working today, unfortunately. Are we ready for our next question, Ed? Rapid fire, keep them coming. How should founders go about securing their first paying customer, whether B2B or B2C? By any means possible. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. And one of the things that I see founders do wrong when it, when it comes down to getting our first customers, they start looking for efficiencies. They start looking for efficiencies when what they should be looking for is effectiveness, right? I don't care about efficiency at the startup stage. I don't care. How do we send a thousand emails? How do we automate this process? How do we build this? Literally don't care. What I'm looking for is efficacy. If you have to walk around and talk to people, that is not efficient. It doesn't scale. Who cares? You know what one of the things that we see startups scale more than anything else? Processes that don't work. We see them scale inefficiencies and ineffectiveness. <laughs> so They're true. easier to scale than what works. That's because so we true. forget to go find out what works first and then scale that. That's so good. at the first table, we're trying to find that first customer, that first user. We want to look for ideally what, uh, do I have time? I don't know how quickly I have to answer these. I want to walk through my early adopter curve really quick. Go for it. Perfect early adopter. So when, when we when we say this, we're going to go, I'm going to go after what's effective, not what's efficient. So I'm going to do the things that don't scale. I'm going to go talk to people, do whatever I have to to find these folks. The folks I'm trying to find, my early adopters are not the people who necessarily suffer most from my problem, not the people who might pay the most for my, my, my solution. I want to find people who are aware of the problem already, so I don't have to educate them. I want people who have already started to look for solutions so that they're aware of what's available. I want people who have already tried some of the solutions so that they know the last and my favorite part, why they're still dissatisfied with the current solution set. And then my unique value proposition aligns with that deficit, with that delta between what they want and what they're getting. And that becomes how I get my first customer. Love it. Let's keep going with the questions. Let's skip the hot take article for today because I think we're going to learn a lot more. Q, how many more questions you got? We've got three more. All right, let's try and bullet through. We got eight minutes. Let's do it. How can founders communicate long-term vision to investors without overselling? By by not overemphasizing it and by having a short-term plan. I can shortcut this into deliver a pitch that aims at the moon, but explains how we clear the fence. Awesome. That's great. What's the simplest, most efficient approach for building an MVP that attracts early users and investors without overcomplicating the development process? Divide, divide what we're validating. Too often, what I end up seeing isn't an MVP. An MVP, too often we, we, we get this wrong, in my opinion. I've coined a phrase a number of years ago that I call the MVP. This is the MMMM MVP, the much more minimum, minimum viable product, because most people build a beta or just their damn product and they that's go, true. here's my MVP. No, that's not an MVP. An MVP is designed to validate your biggest, scariest binary assumptions that if they're true, we go forward. If they're false, we have to rethink things. So if I believe something to be true, my MVP needs to be designed to validate that is true or false. I want to figure out a falsifiable question that I can ask, and then I want to go find it if it's true or false. Very often, MVP, we end up trying to bake way too much, and we're trying to validate a whole bunch of stuff. We're not good at multivariate analysis. This is why when we A-B test, we literally only change one thing. And yet when we build our MVP, we throw all these variables in and then we try to say, well, that worked or it didn't. And then we ask why we have no idea. What would you change next? I don't know. Why? Because you tested too much stuff. So for me, MVP is a process, not a thing. And it is about, it's a series of experiments, of tests, of micro products, of presentations, of questions, of service engagements that validate these super big binary go, no go type problems. That's great. Thanks, Ryan. Our last question is, what are some quick and cost-effective ways for founders to validate their startup idea before they start building the product, especially when time and resources are limited? This one, uh, this one's a little context dependent because I think it depends a lot with this B2B, B2C, like where we go to get the answers to this. See previous example, which is think through what do we actually need to validate? What are the, what are the big ones? Like we don't need to start validating like second, third, fourth tier features. We need to think about like when presented with a pathway to a solution that we believe they want, have we validated they actually want the outcome, right? Are they, are they invested in the transformation? And then are they willing to follow the path that, that we, that we take them down, right? So, and if they're willing to do those things upon reaching the path, do they actually achieve that value, right? And so this is a way of saying, 
how do we boil this down to its simplest part? Before I go and build product, before I go and even build an MVP, can I walk somebody through what's required? Again, what's effective versus what's efficient? This is not an efficient way of doing this at all. It's a very effective way, which ends up being time and cost efficient, okay? We want to get to an understanding very quickly of if we do, if we can get people to do all the necessary things to achieve the value that we think will achieve the value, do they achieve the value? And is that value commensurate with what we would or did charge them, All right? So it kind of depends on what stage we're at with the product when we begin to engage in this, how far down the, the ideation and validation and MVP curve we are. But the thing I'm always trying to get to, because if not, we run a real risk of building a clever marketing trap and not an actual business. Mm. Right? We see this all the time. Like there, there's, there are people on the internet, I shall not name any of them, who every couple of months, you're going to see them with some new digital product, some new take on SEO or how to market or this growth hack or that thing. And they're going to teach it to you, right? And there's a reason they have a new one all the time. And it's not that they're just at the cutting edge of stuff. It's because they have to completely change what they're selling because it's already run its course and it doesn't work for people and they can't sell any more of it, right? They built a clever marketing track, but they didn't provide value which is what builds a business. Those are good. Some pearls of wisdom there, my friend, Ryan. Appreciate it. Okay, that brings us to the end. I did see another Q&A come in. We don't have time to answer that question. Make sure, come back. We'll try and answer it. I believe that it's from a member, so we can handle that as part of startups.com. That's it for us. We're here every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at the same time. Appreciate everything that... Everybody's contributed all the questions. Q, as always, what you do. Jen, thanks for handling all the chat and the FAQ. Ryan, thank you for joining us. I'm going to give you the last word. If you have to plug, if you have to plug us, startups.com, for everybody who's going to be watching this, what would you have to say? Oh, man. Well, for this particular episode, um, given that we were so pitch deck focused, if you haven't already, jump into the pitch deck perfection workshops or the pitch deck doctor office hours. That's where you're going to learn the, the framework that I referenced earlier around how we teach you how to communicate the most critical things that need to be communicated, regardless of what order they appear in or what slides that they're on. Super insanely valuable we are doing one of those live whether you are a member or not next tuesday one o'clock eastern check the site watch your email and we will be putting these out on the socials the, the link's not live for registration yet it will be in about right on morning. we will put those links right there in the description check us out a lot more free resources here at startups.com that's it for us today thanks everyone for joining i'll see you next time